Veterans Day. They didn't know what Veterans Day was. They didn't. They didn't. And they asked, "Well, they said, well, who bombed us at Pearl Harbor?" Did they didn't know that? They either. didn't know. I mean, it, yeah. it's abysmal uh, what some of this stuff is. Anyway, today's uh, uh, November the ninth. We're uh, waiting to see whether we got a new president. Very close. And uh, today we have John Barton with us. John Barton served in the Navy in World War II in both the Atlantic and Pacific. He saw some real hot action over there. And we're going to talk to him about his experiences as one of our uh, World War II veterans uh, in Sterling here. Okay. okay. All right, we're ready. Yeah. My yeah. name is John Barton. And uh, I uh, was in World War II. I joined the Navy in Denver, Colorado. And I wanted to be a pilot. So uh, I when, did, when did you join the? I joined the Navy in uh, uh, July of uh, 1942. 42. And I got out in February of 1946 in Shoemaker, California. Four years. Yeah. And you, so you joined right after Pearl Harbor. Well, a little few, few months after. Yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. that was a stimulus. You yeah. wanted to be an aviator. Yes. And what happened to you? Well, you know, everybody asks, what were you doing the day of Pearl Harbor? I'll tell you what I was doing. Right. I have a little 37 Chevrolet convertible, which I still have. I was with Glenn Moffat and Neil Sandstead out near the North Sterling Reservoir hunting jackrabbits. <laughs> and <laughs> didn't even know the war. That How old were you then? Oh, I was... Uh, 18? Yeah, 18, I guess, something there. And it, we didn't even know the Japs had bombed the thing. We come back in, folks told us we didn't know. It didn't have a radio in the car. It'd run the battery down. So we, then we come back, and that kind of uh, changed our college. We couldn't, they didn't want to go to college. Well, I don't think he could stay in very long anyway. And uh, then we uh, all come back, and Moffat, he tried to join, and he couldn't get in physically, and later on he did. Neil Sandstead, I guess you remember him. Yes. He's at the college's room. He died, uh, not from the war, just died otherwise. And uh, then I, I went on up to Denver, took my physical pass, and they said, nope, you can't fly for us either. I tried the Air Force first. And um, so uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll get into something in aviation. So they said, you have schools in mechanics, you have school in ordnance, which is bombs, guns, and so forth, torpedoes. And I said, all right, I'll take that one. So they sent me out to San Diego. Now you went, this was in the Navy though. That was in the Navy. You started in the Air Force, but they turned you down. Yeah. And you went across the street, across same the, day. Same day. Signed up for the Navy. Signed up for the Navy. Okay. And uh, I'd quit my job and, and uh, said goodbye and everything. And they said, well, we can't send you away for a week. So I had to come back to Sterling after saying all my goodbyes. <laughs> Do it over. Yeah, and I had just got engaged to Helen, and I and we decided Helen Crawl. Helen Crawl. Right. And when uh, we decided the first time I come home on leave, we would get married, and that was agreeable with everybody. All right. The first time I got home was when the war was over. I never got to leave the whole never time. Never got back. In never four got years. back. Is so right? talk about a long engagement. I think I've got almost a Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> But she hung in there. Oh, yes. You guys have been yeah. together a long time now, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, Well, that's great. We, so we got married in Denver, and then we went out to California and uh, Camp Shoemaker, and that was a big separation center. And we got uh, finally, and uh, <laughs> there's quite a history to that. She, uh, my pay records, I, I was in Philadelphia and had to go all the way across to California to get out because I was in the 16th Naval District. And you, I was in line for... About five hours in Philadelphia, and got up to the window, and the guy said, oops, can't get you out of here. You're in another naval district. And I thought, well, that's a waste of money, but then what the heck. So anyway, I, we went back there. We got married and went back. And um, I was at the base, and I had to stay there for about a month, I guess. That's and my in record, California. In California, and my records had just got there. And I didn't take much money with me. Didn't think it'd be like that. And we got a motel there. And... Uh, real nice people and she didn't have any money so towards <laughs> the last week and I couldn't get off the base for a little bit and finally when I got off the base I found out that she had been eating apples most all the time that's all she could afford was apples and then <laughs> the, the guy said well if we'd known that we'd have put you up you know 
anyway, that's the start of my career. And uh, your married career. <laughs> my married career, yeah. yeah. And it's been uh, 56 years. Well, that's good. Yeah. So the apples were good. Yeah, good apples, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not so bad. Yeah. So getting back to your military career okay. here, we got yeah. you. We got you in the Navy, and I went you signed to, up for ordnance, yeah. and you're heading out for the West Coast. Yes, I went to San Diego, took my boot training there, and <clears throat> we uh, uh, took some training, just basic training. And then when it came time for the school to open, it was in Norman, Oklahoma. So I went to Norman, Oklahoma, and had the basic on gunnery and bombs. That was what we studied. And uh, from there, we went to an advanced school where we were uh, in turrets, 50 caliber machine guns, twin turrets. And that was at uh, uh, a little town right outside of, of uh, Norman. And we went to Norman, which is a short distance right. uh, to Oklahoma City. And we went there, and I guess I was there probably well, four months. And then we went down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida on the East Coast. And that's where you got into the plains. So that was my first adventure in a plane with a turret on it. And I can remember the thing that scared me most. I'm sitting there with two facing backwards, sort of the tail, two 50 caliber loaded machine guns. And they pull in a, a plane that's pulling the target across. And where to shoot at it, we had colored painted bullets so we could tell who's hit the target. Then across there, and when I got there, and they had told us, and we practiced, when you get to the tail, just keep shooting, because you won't shoot the tail off. It has some loads, and it'll skip it, and then start firing again. Well, I swung around there, and I saw that tail sticking up, and boy, I stopped for a minute until it got across. It took me a little while to get used to it. I wasn't going to shoot the tail off the plane. Oh, you're off your own plane. Off my own plane, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so then we had quite a lot of uh, flying time there, and then we'd fly What out. plane were you flying in there? That was a TBF. Big, that's a big... Uh, that's a, yeah, it's a torpedo bomber. And it has a, a pontoon type... Uh, no, it had no, it was on for, we were practicing then to go on carriers. Okay, so that okay, has, that's so a wheeled that, aircraft. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And so... Um, Is we, that a twin we, engine we, plane or...? One engine. Uh -huh. One engine. One Pratt, engine. Pratt Whitney, big, big bucker. And it had a crew of three, a radioman, the gunner, myself, and the pilot. Okay. And we could talk amongst each other. And uh, it got kind of boring. You know, the Navy pilot's probably one of the best there is because you fly out way past land and there's no markings. Right. And you've got to find your way back to that little postage stamp of a ship. Right. That's what it looked like. And so I always felt that they were the best. But, and we did all that training and uh, they were forming different squadrons and they asked if I'd uh, like to go on uh, the African invasion with these and another type of plane. I said, sure because we wouldn't get any place there. So they sent us uh, by boat down to Trinidad, <coughs> and we uh, got onto another air base there, and they flew us down to Brazil. And my first station was at Natal. And then there was one at Belém and uh, San Diego, almost like San Diego. And then we flew down to Rio. And there were quite a few bases of, of seaplanes, and they were big ones. They were the PBMs, PBMs two, en okay. two engine, a crew of thirteen, and we could we had beds that we could sleep on. We had places to cook. They had a regular guy; he cooked your meals on you because we'd be out oh, fifteen hours or better, see at a time, and we'd fly to a little island called Ascension Island, and refuel there and leave mail and supplies, and then we'd go on patrol towards Africa. I didn't land in Africa. I saw the coastline, and then we'd circle and go. We were looking for submarines because they were really doing trouble to our troop ships right. for men, supplies, and whatever. And we got quite a number of submarines. And if we come to a submarine, we come to one, one ship that uh, it looked just like a freighter. And we'd go by it to look at flags, and they didn't have any flags. So we flew back again, and by that time, the deck was covered with big boxes, all those things wheeled back, I suppose, hydraulic or by man, I don't know. But they had the biggest guns on that thing you saw. So we got our little plane out of there. Right. And we called the Army. And they had um, uh, Martin Ventura, which were pretty fast planes. And they had bigger bombs than we did. We just had depth charges because we were looking for submarines. And then they shot this one up pretty bad and escorted him back into, into Brazil. And uh, Argentina at that time, was a friend of the Germans. 
and we could see a lot of German stuff, even the close there. I saw a Graf Zeppelin with the swastika on the tail flying just close to our base. It was a captured one, you know, but I didn't know it at the time. Oh, it was captured, is that yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and we, I have a picture of that someplace when you can see the swastika real good. And uh, so then they got all the, all the uh, crew that they could save, because they bombed it pretty heavy, back to base. And if you, and I, t too bad that I could not speak German. If I could have, I'd have had a good duty, because anyone that could speak German got to stand guard duty because they didn't know who the captain was, and they wouldn't tell them. So what they'd do, they'd, uh, they'd take, uh, give a guy, you get four hours on, four off, and you'd keep watching. Sooner or later, the bulk of the sailors that were captured from the submarine or from that other ship, uh, they were going to a submarine. It was kind of like a uh, no, freighter that helped them out. And they would listen and see who they talked to all the time. And they went, finally found out who the captain was by just that way. Oh, the captain of the, of yeah, the crew. of the crew. That they and, captured. And, and that, that they captured. And they found out who it was by just having the sailors that could speak German. And they didn't tell the crew that they could, see. Well, there's a lot of, I thought of some of these guys I knew in Sterling, man, they could have had good duty. That's right. They could and speak. all they go was from there to Miami and then right back, see, because they'd catch another one, see. Yeah. And we had uh, uh, one. Now, when you say they'd go from, like, uh, where would they go from? Brazil? Yeah, they they And they'd they, take these Germans back to Miami, is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they they take them back to Miami and, and put them in. Uh, concentration camps somewhere and interview them and try and get what they could sure. out of them. And, uh, yeah, sure. See, the, the neighboring country of Brazil was Argentina, which was uh, where the submarines and ships from Germany could refuel. Yeah, they, Argentina yeah, was yeah, they, they, uh, a Nazi yeah, uh, yeah. And, it, and today, you know, when they had all the war criminal trials, they found an awful lot of Germans in Argentina. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they tracked them down. Yeah, there's a lot of Germans down yeah. in that uh -huh. country, yeah. yeah. And then after that, uh, we had one little uh, shell hit the side of the uh, PBM, knocked a little hole in, didn't hurt anything. And uh, we got back and... Uh, where, now, where was that that you got shelled? That, that was off the coast of... Uh, of uh, on, on the way to... to uh, Ascension? Africa. What, to uh, on on patrol, yeah. Yeah, yeah Ascension Island is a very small island. And guys that had duty on that island, they were the ones that didn't do very good anywhere else. It was a, almost a prison. <laughs> and it was very small and hot and windy and dry. And seagulls were the only entertainment you could find out there. And we'd take mail to them and, and pick up stuff and, as we went by, you know. And uh, then uh, when uh, Rommel, who was the head of the Germans over in Africa, when he finally got defeated by uh, Monty Montgomery from the English and uh, uh, Oh, no, I don't know who, uh, what officer was in the army over there. I don't, know if it, I don't think it was Patton. No, the American general? Yeah. With Montgomery? Yeah. Jeez, I can't remember that. Well, any, anyway, it didn't make a difference. Anyway, uh, when they, they got that all done, why they took the patrol bombers and everything else, and I don't know where they took them someplace, and then we all flew back on, on uh, uh, C-47s. Uh, there's no seats in them, just open cargo. We take our sleeping bag and stuff, throw in a corner, and I was noted in those days for being a good sleeper. I could sleep on a pile of rocks; it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> and, we, and we flew from Rio de Janeiro to Atlantic City, New Jersey, and there we got on the air base, and they were taking volunteers. I wasn't very smart in those days because I volunteered for about everything. <laughs> anyway, it worked out pretty big because I volunteered for a squadron, not knowing too much about it, but it was going to be carrier based. And squadron guys weren't liked too well by the oh, crew. That's right, John. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's okay. all right. Keep going. So, okay. and so uh, are, are you on now? So, so you're headed? Well, we got to Atlantic City, Atlantic New Jersey. City. Okay, go ahead. And they had to retrain again because it's a different type of aircraft. And uh, it still had the twin 50 caliber guns in the turret, but it's only a three man plane where we had 13 before. And uh, th then we went from there to um, uh, back to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for more training in that particular plane. And what was that plane? TBF. TBF, okay. Martin Vin, uh, uh, Grumman, Grumman, big engine in it. And uh, 
they were very powerful, but they were slow. And they had a pretty good range. And they had a big bomb bay that we could either put a long torpedo in it or a bunch of 250 or 500 pound bombs. Okay. And uh, depending on what your mission was. And uh, then from there, we uh, finally picked up the ship uh, at uh, San Diego. And we boarded the ship and got all our planes and formed everything. And uh, uh, of my squadron that I had at that time, there's only 14 of us living today. The rest have passed away. Wow. And it wasn't just physical things. It wasn't war injuries, you know. Uh-huh. And a couple What of ship did you get on then? On then we got on the Saratoga. The Saratoga. Yeah, okay. big. Famous. It was one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Our runway was 1,000 foot long which was pretty good. And uh, Thousand feet. then we went on out to Pearl Harbor and uh, just milled with some other ships. And we had various... Uh, About what year was that? That would be in 43. 1943. That was in 1943. Okay. So that was a couple of years after you'd yeah. gone into the service. Right. And you'd seen service in the South Atlantic, in South America, Africa, or yeah. Coast of Africa, yeah, right. and then back to the States, and now you're headed for the Pacific. Yeah, right. And um, we had uh, we had various task force. We had uh, Admiral King and Mitzer and Bull Halsey and uh, all the big ones. And quite often they would be on our ship because it was a, even though it was an older ship, it was one that was built very well. In fact. Uh, Later on, it proved to be built so good it didn't sink, and uh, so that we. Were you on it when they had those big attacks? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the only time I wasn't on it, it was scheduled to go to Australia, and I hadn't been on it yet, and it, uh, it took a Jap torpedo just close to uh, uh, Australia, and they had to turn around and come back and patch it up and stuff, and then that's when we got back on it. And it's plates on the side, I call it plates, it's armor plated, very thick, and uh, which turned out to be good. It was number three, and the Lexington, another famous one, was number uh, one. It was, that was the group we were in, each class, I say group class. And we formed a task force with uh, other carriers and battleships, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers, and destroyer escorts because they were for hitting islands. And we, we had, uh, oh, and after a while, they would take and uh, change it, uh, say we're in Task Force 15, okay, well, we'd be in that one for maybe a month, and then all of a sudden our Task Force was 17. Well, the Japs didn't know we were the same Task Force, just changed the number. Yeah. And it kind of tricked them, really, and, and uh, we did that all through there. And we got into a bad typhoon off of Formosa, and, uh, it peeled part of our carrier deck back, about 100 foot of it on the nose. The storm was so bad, it just ripped the front of the flight deck up. Well, we had to go back into Guam and get that fixed. But we didn't sink, and a little crew, uh, destroyer was right beside us. And it came over to sea, I suppose, if it could help. And all of a sudden, a big wave hit it, turned it upside down. Wow. And upside down, and you could see smoke belching out. You could see the props on the back spinning in the water. And in about five minutes, it was gone. And we couldn't even pick up the men because the sea was too bad, see. So they didn't try that anymore. But when we got, to, and after, the, after that, we uh, had to take these islands back gradually that they were taking from us. Montgomery, or not, um, not Montgomery. Uh, MacArthur. MacArthur said, I'll be back when, you know, when they took the guys and they, they sent them back. But anyway, we uh, started going to Island. And my worst attack, which I thought I was going to die, was at the Battle of Iwo Jima. That was a little island over there and they, it must be a dozen of them and they all go with Jima. Chickajima, Iwo Jima, a whole bunch of Jimas. And, and they were all Japanese held. So our, our, uh, mission was to bomb these islands because they had small airports on them and they would bomb our men as they approached the island. My wife's brother, Ken Crawl, was in the Marines. 
I saw him at Pearl Harbor, and he said, John, be careful to be yourself. And so he was on the third wave to go in on the island of Iwo Jima. And he got on that, and he got hurt quite bad. And I, uh, later on, I saw him at uh, uh, Guam. He was in the hospital there, and I got to see him over there. But anyway, get back to this battle. They, that's when they hit us with, with the kamikazes and the bombs. But uh, they hit us quite hard, and the ship was on fire. And they said, prepare to abandon ship. Now, how many, you told me uh, earlier on, how many kamikaze uh, uh, pilots struck your ship? Yeah, there were uh, approximately. Five, five, approximately five kamikazes, which was suicide planes. Right. And, the, and the seven bombs. And they were, uh, weren't suicide, but they might as well have been. Well, sure. And the, the, those direct hits, we had a lot of misses, too. And we had that, and it started terrible fires. We had a whole bunch of Marines that flew F-4U fighter planes, which really a hot plane. And they were on the front of the ship, and you know, it killed about half of that Marine detachment just by bombs hitting the flight deck. Wow. And uh, then uh, we, uh, that, that battle lasted quite a while. And they sent another, I, if I, I believe it was the Liscombe Bay, little carrier, smaller, come over to see if they could be of any help. And they come over and a Jap uh, suicide plane got onto the uh, pyrotechnic locker on it. And in 15 minutes, it was under the water. The, and, the whole and, thing? The whole ship. And it was, it was a, a smaller carrier, but still pretty good size. Sure. We picked up what we could of survivors. It was still daylight. So this happened, started about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And by, oh, 6 o'clock it was all over. And they said um, everybody was ready to abandon ship. And I had on my Mae West jackets, three of them, all kinds. I didn't want to take any chances. Right. And I had a little red light on my shoulder in case in the bobbing water that would be able to be seen quite well. And uh, So uh, the old chief come, and I had a, a 38 on my hip, and I had a knife on me, and I had a whole bunch of, of waterproof food in cans, GI canteen stuff. The old chief said, Barton, what are you going to do with all that stuff? I said, well, if we get to an island, I'll, I'll probably sell you some of it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you ain't selling me. And he said, if you don't get out of that stuff, when you jump over the side, you're just going to go straight to the bottom. Like a rock, huh? <laughs> just like a rock. And so I took a lot of it off, and about a half hour later, they ca canceled the abandoned ship. We got the fire under control. And then we gradually got back to Guam, and uh, then they uh, were going to patch it up there, and then they flew us back to Pearl Harbor. And we got on another carrier, a little bit smaller one. It was a converted light cruiser. We had too many cruisers. Now, when you say we, you're talking about your crew? Or yes, the, the squadron. Your squadron. Yeah. Our How squad many guys in your squadron, would you guess? In our squadron, we had, uh, uh, oh, probably uh, 60. And that, that was made up of pilots, pilots, support and, people, right, mechanics and people, e everything, gunners everything. like yourself. Yeah, uh, and, and and there'd be radio men, gunners, mechanics, and just general crewmen. Sure. And and we didn't have to do too much of the mechanics because the ship had their own mechanics and they were good. So what we'd do, we'd land the plane, and sometimes on a carrier the ru the water would be rough. Why, uh, you were taught, the pilot was taught, I wasn't a pilot, taught to when the plane come up, that's when you started to make your approach to the carrier. And then as the plane, as the carrier started on in, in swells, right. and as the ship started downward, that's when your plane come in and landed on the flight deck. And uh, because once in a while you'd miss cue, and you'd come in, you hit the flight deck as the carrier come up. Okay, it was such a force that would buckle a fuselage of the plane and ruin it. So we, after the operation was over, we'd all get together and take off the things that we were short of, gun sights and bomb things, and save them. And then after, we would take and push that complete plane over the end of the carrier, drop it in the water, and it was bye-bye. And uh, that we, had, we got a lot of ships that way. <laughs> then then uh, that was an everyday occurrence because uh, some of the water was rough, some was smooth. Then later on, I got attached to an, another volunteer job to a night squadron. All we did was fly at night. And uh, 
It didn't bother me. I didn't have to land the plane. <laughs> the pilot was good. And, and it was, yeah, I can still see in my mind, the uh, guys would be on the end of the, the uh, signalman, and he'd be there, and uh, you could see his little flags. And they had infrared flags, so that if Japs, a lot of times Japs would follow your plane in and try and get in your flight pattern and bomb you as you come in. But this kind of stopped that because they couldn't see the, they didn't have the right lights to read the flags. And we'd do that at night. And then we had the first. Now, where was that? That, that was, was off the coast of Japan. Off Japan. Okay. Yeah. We made. So you'd gone past Iwo Jima. Iwo oh, Jima yeah, was the, uh, yeah. captured and you, had, and you were assigned to a new carrier. New carrier. And you were back on the coast of Japan or off the coast uh, of coast Japan. Japan, yeah. Okay. And we uh, uh, had uh, night duty and we made some bombings right on the edge of Japan. Scared that we were, what it was, that they were getting ready to have a big invasion. Right. A and uh, the first one that scared them so bad was uh, Jimmy Doodle when he flew the bombers over there. And they never came back. They had to land in China yeah, or wherever. Yeah, they flew on into China, yeah. 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 And uh, so that gave them the idea of what we could do. So we had them on their, on their feet, and then they were scared. And we do that just at night. And uh, luckily, most of the night landings were pretty good weather. Seemed like the weather was better at night than in the daytime. Wind would go yeah, down. Yeah, I stuff. suppose, yeah. yeah. And, and we uh, enjoyed good that. We, we slept in the daytime and, and worked at night. How long did you do that? Did I did get? that. That was a short, I suppose that didn't last more than six months. Because by then we were getting ready to drop the big bombs on Hiroshima right. and uh, Nagasaki. Nagasaki, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we set some kind of a record. This I say we, it's the carriers. The Saratoga, I was on it at that time. It was before we had the big battles. And we were out at sea longer than any other task force ever did without going back in to get supplies. We had all our supplies brought to us, which would be groceries, mail, uh, and fuel, fuel yeah. any, anything. And that was quite a thing. And, I can still remember they'd, the old boatsman, he'd blow a little whistle and, and uh, it'd be over the microphone on the ship and his voice would say, the smoking lamp is out. The smoking lamp is out. No cigarettes. And boy, if they caught you, I think they'd get you because you're, you're refueling, see. Right. And, and we had a lot of fuel on those, very big. In fact, uh, Helen's brother says, John, you can have those carriers. He said, I want ground under me. He said, sit on all that gasoline all that time. That's right. And, and bombs. bombs. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. All that ordinance. Yeah. God. And then he was the one that got hit, and I didn't. But anyway, uh, it, uh, that was, oh, I can't remember. I've got some papers at home someday. And, uh, I'll have to find that stuff. It tells what the record was. Yeah. And to get back to another record, I'm going to tell you this. When I was in, in Oklahoma training back on the ground course, uh, I could run in those days pretty good, can't now. But they had uh, obstacle courses, which were all sorts of things, climbing ropes, running down this, going in, in steel pipes through the mud, and they would fire live 30 caliber bullets right over your head, so you had to keep your head down. OK, well, I had some buddies that were mechanics, and they'd get off different times than I do. But the base said anyone that can run this course in a certain length of time will get a free pass to town. It, his choice. So my buddy said, hey, John, we're going to town tomorrow. Go over and run. So I'd go over and run. I got a free pass. Could go with him to town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. A real stimulus yeah. to run that oh, course. Huh? Yeah. It, it wasn't much of a job for me. I a little kind of skinny fell in those days. <laughs> and and uh, uh, it was pretty good. And they'd try their darndest. One big old Italian kid, huskier than heck, he just couldn't get over the high boards, climb that rope and get up top. It's all he could do to pull himself to the top. Then when he got to the top, he didn't like to look down. <laughs> he never did go over that Never one. got to town. Huh? Never got to town, <laughs> yeah, except on his regular days when he could. But that was uh, uh, on just this one base in Oklahoma. Okay, what uh, was the, uh, now so you, you, did you end the war up off the coast of Japan? Is that what yes. happened? They dropped a bomb and. Yeah. And, and Japan and, capitulated. Yeah, and when MacArthur was on the battleship Missouri in the harbor, signing it with, uh, well, I don't know who all the officers were, the whole crew, plus the Japs, we, our turn was to just patrol out in the uh, bay, Tokyo Bay. And uh, 
we thought, boy, and the, and the ship was just, we were playing music, just having a ball, it was real nice. All of a sudden they rang general quarters. <laughs> the, the, the war was over. They were signing the peace treaty right there on board the Missouri. Here come three kamikazes, diehard guys that would not give up the battle. They were bound and determined they were going to get another ship. And there were a lot of them because we weren't really uh, prepared for battle then. Yeah. It meant we, uh, quick though, we uh, shot those down. Is that right? Yeah, and that ended it. But we were on, on uh, guard duty after that. No more liberties. For, and then they also, after that was over, they asked for volunteers to go ashore of Japan just to check their airfields and stuff. And I went aboard on, on the landing party, and uh, we had fatigues in a, in a 30 caliber, uh, well, it was a 30 odd six Springfield gun that we didn't think we'd have to use, which we didn't. But we got to go to some of the bases. And you know, they still had a lot of, of uh, uh, suicide bombs that the Japs had. They uh, didn't, they weren't manned, they were just ready to go up. Kind of like that thing over in uh, when the V2, similar mm -hmm. to that, only smaller. Mm -hmm. And we found a lot of that, and an awful lot of planes, and a lot of those nasty little Japs, they were little short fellas, and they hadn't shaved for a while, and they looked pretty tough. I'll bet. But uh, we all, uh, quite a group of us, so I got to do that. And, and uh, so another, another thing that I volunteered for, and uh, we were eyes only on, on the island of Japan, oh, maybe three hours. And all you did was just walk around and look and see what you could see. And the Japs then were all prisoners, and they weren't any of them uh, walking around with you, you know. Yeah. So, so then you finished up the war in Japan. Mm -hmm. Then what? Then, okay, did, then did you fly back, or how did you come no, back? No, we went. We came back. Uh, at that time, I was on the Monterey, and it was pretty good. It had only been strafed. It never did get. The bombs never hit it. So we came back to. Uh, uh, the Monterey's a carrier. Carrier, it's a carrier, CV-26. It's a converted CV, means converted light cruiser. And like I started to say, we had a lot of cruisers and not enough carriers. So they were in the process of being built, which is a new ship. Then they took their decks off and put a flight deck on it and oh. made a carrier out okay. of it. And it was a little slower and a little lighter armor plate on the sides, but it got by. Then we went uh, all the way down to Panama got to go through the Panama Canal. In fact, I got a Panama silver dollar. In order to get one down there in the town of Balboa, you had to buy something because the sailors were taking all their coins home, see? <laughs> so if you bought something, you'd get a dollar and change. All right, so I did that, and we were there a few days, and uh, along come, uh, that was quite interesting going through there on a carrier. In fact, I had to, I had to four to, I said the 12 to four watch that night. <laughs> <coughs> and we hadn't gone through the canal yet. When I woke up in the morning, I looked out over the side, and there was grass, yeah. houses, stuff. I thought, wow, this is something, <laughs> right beside the ship. Right. And they pulled us through with the docks, how they'd lower the water and fill it up, and then you'd go to the next level, go on through there. And we got on to, uh, there's Chris Tobel on one side and Balboa on the other. I think Balboa was on the Pacific side, right. Chris Tobel on the Atlantic Land, side. Yeah. And uh, then there were... Uh, a bunch of uh, English ships. They had a big battle wagon there. Well, we fought with them and helped each other out. But when you're in town on a port, they weren't your friends. <laughs> they were. They were not your friends. And they had. <laughs> so they, those limeys, they didn't oh, get along with you guys. Oh, so. you betcha. They had uh, a, a little bar there, pretty good sized bar, called the Green Lantern. And it seemed like that's where all these men would go to and uh, get liquored up, I suppose. Well, this friend of mine, Murphy, was on his way to Boston, Massachusetts to get married. And he got off first before I did. So finally, when I got my work done and could get off, I was standing in line waiting to get off. And uh, here come two ambulances back to the, to the uh, dock. And lo and behold, there was Murphy. Murphy was in Murphy the ambulance. Was, he was a little Irishman and fighting son of a gun, you know. The side of his head got split open, some limey, picked up a bottle of whiskey and hit him on the side of the head, split it open, <laughs> knocked him out. They put him in the ambulance, brought back, well, they had to clean him up and he couldn't go to shore anymore. 
So I waited a little while. I knew he'd never get back on that day. So then I went ashore, but stayed away from that Green Lantern. Yeah, right. I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> but he was he was a very good friend of mine. And invited me to his wedding. We went to his wedding in Boston. He married a Portuguese girl, and Portuguese language is about like the Spanish. Close. Yeah. Yeah. Very close. I can still remember the Portuguese word for beer, cerveja. 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 <laughs> Uma cerveja. Mucho cold. <laughs> Mucho frio. Yeah. <laughs> what was your highest rank? The you highest, said you almost made chief, or you were getting yeah. ready to stand chief. Yeah, I was studying for the examination for chief. My highest rank that I retired out of was aviation ordnance first class. First class, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, when you uh, when you went into the navy, you were a seaman. Right. Then you were a seaman second, and then a seaman first, and then you finally become a petty officer which was third class petty officer, which is one bar on your sleeve. And then uh, you got to be second class petty officer, which was two stripes. Then you got to be a first class, and that was three stripes. You're, uh, in the army, it would be like a master sergeant. Right. And, and uh, then uh, I, uh, I still have the books that I studied out of. I got those at home, and uh, you got to keep them, you know. Sure. A and uh, so I studied pretty good for the chief, and it was probably within Oh, a week or two of taking the exam, and that would have been at uh, Philadelphia Naval Base. That's where we were at. Well, when they decided to send us back to, to uh, Colorado, 16th Naval District. And I got back there, and Camp Shoemaker, it was just full of men waiting to get out. And it was quite unpleasant. Even though I had a pretty good rank, I had to walk out and pick up cigarette butts. They had nothing. <laughs> Is that right? They had nothing else for us to do. So. Yeah, they're keeping you busy. <laughs> yeah, out of yeah. trouble. Yeah, and sure. I thought, well, boy, if this is life, I'm good. So I just, how old were you then, John? At that uh, at that age, I was uh, twenty, uh, about twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. And I decided, no, I. Uh, there was a local boy from Sterling. His name Bob Weir. He lived on Park Street, and his dad was a railroader when my father was a railroader. And uh, I met him over in Pearl Harbor, and he was an electrician, first class, and we needed one. I told my chief, I think he'd be a good one. So he got on board. And otherwise, he'd have been in Pearl Harbor today, I think, because once you get stationed on the island and or on a ship, not a squadron, why, you were there forever. Yeah. And so he said, I said, we change every six months, Bob. You won't be on this one but about six months. And he liked that. So he got it, and so he thanked me for that. I still receive Christmas cards at, from him. And uh, in, in school in Sterling, Helen, my wife, Helen Crawl, said she was, lived right behind him in the alley. Says he is a mean sucker, John. I don't know why you ever asked him to join. <laughs> He's a mean one, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he turned out to be a pretty good so friend. You, now, of course, you got a lot of uh, battle citations and awards and stuff. Tell yeah. us about some of those. Okay, well. Did you get wounded? No, I didn't get wounded. Uh, I could have, I guess, if I'd have been about. The closest I'd come to getting wounded, it was in the, in the Battle of Iwo Jima again. And uh, we, like I said, I was a night squadron, so I wasn't doing anything in the daytime. Our attack was in the day. And I and a mechanic friend of mine, uh, we were in the, fly, in the hangar deck below when some of these bombs started hitting and started fires. So we headed down towards the back of the aft of the ship, and there were big manhole cover, about like a manhole cover in a street. And we got to those. And uh, I, luckily I outran him just a little bit. And instead of jumping down, I kind of dove down. And there was a ladder. I could get a hold and went on down. And Al, he went down and he took his time going down. And I'll be darned if, if Fragment didn't hit him in the leg and uh, put him out of the war. Uh, he got wounded then. I so he lives in Kansas City now, and I see him every once in a while. Yeah. But it wasn't anything that bothered him. He limped a little bit, and that was all. So uh, he, if he'd have been just a little faster and went with his feet first, might have got him in the head. I don't know, but he went head first. And you guys weren't really loafing around, did no, you? No, no, no. Yeah, go no, I thought cover. that obstacle course was fast. This was a lot faster. <laughs> yes. And then we we got there, and that's uh, then we went to a we were assigned to a particular part of the ship during battle. We've got to that, the ones that could. And uh, that's when, uh, when we got hit pretty bad. And then they, again, old John, he was kind of dumb. He was another volunteer. There were so many, there was one place, uh, there were 84 men 
to be stationed in there so they'd know where they were. They had nothing to do, play cards, whatever they could. And it was just under the turns, big turns on the carrier. This again was on the Saratoga. And uh, would you know that we shot a plane down, knocked its wing off, one wing, and it spiraled like that. And uh, if you remember when you were a young fellow, you used to take a rock and skip across the water. Mm -hmm. That's what that plane did, skipped across. We shot it many times, and it didn't blow up. And it bounced off and hit just under those guns. And that's where it hit that little room, which wasn't armor plated too good. Killed a whole bunch of them. Wow. So when the battle was all over, they asked for volunteers. They had a big cleanup de detail. So Big John, you know, he didn't go help them. <laughs> and I, I would never have made a doctor. That's a mess. No, no, yeah. And anyway, the lights weren't in. You had to have flashlights. And I got a hospital corpsman to help me, and we started moving them around. And, and uh, if you found any live ones, you'd give them to them, and they'd take them up. But we didn't find any right then. So I got a hold of this guy's legs, and he got a hold of his arms. We took him to this little hatchway door, smaller than those, and put him out in the hall, and someone put him on a cart, took him up above. And he said, OK, we'll go down for another one. I said, no, sir, I can't do it. I couldn't go down for the second trip because when I put him on the cart, his leg came off in my hand. Oh, Jesus. And I thought, no, John, you're not made for this. So I'd have made a poor doctor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think anybody would like that, John. No, that, but they finally, that's, not, they, that's not good that's stuff. That's kind of gory, but that's yeah. that what happened. And uh, then they, so, got, go ahead. they got the lights all working again, and then you could go in and see what was going on, see. Yeah. Pretty bad. So... Uh, how many people would you guess were uh, killed or injured in that uh, well, particular thing? Uh, one day, what they do, they take the, the, the uh, parachute riggers and uh, they would take and make a canvas sack and they would put a big projectile, just not the case, just the projectile, in that case and sew it up. And we'd have six at a time on a long plank on the edge of the ship and then the chaplain would say prayers, they'd blow taps, and at a given time, they had a, a sailor by each one of these boards, they'd tip it up, and the body would go plop into the water. And the projectile would be to hold them in, so they'd go under the water. Right. And a couple of them, the projectile come out, and so they floated for quite a while. But we, we buried, uh, well, in two, day, in two days' time, we buried 184 wow. men off that battle. Yeah, oh, that's and there were th this one guy that uh, he, he was uh, in a yellow shirt. Each each group of men had a shirt. There would be blue for mechanics, red for ordnance, and green for something. And then this one was yellow. They were the ones that launched the planes. They'd be out there, and the pilot could see them. They get out, and they'd wave the flag for him to rev up his engine real good. And then he'd go his flag that way, and then the plane would take off. Well, this one guy, I got to know him pretty good, and uh, didn't see him for a few days. And we were on our way back to, back to Pearl Harbor, or Guam it was. And I saw him, and he had his one arm cut off, and uh, just had his sleeve sewed, but still in good spirits. And that was all that happened. No other scratches, just blew his arm off. Wow. Yeah. And so he got discharged there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So did you get any medal citations or awards? I'm sure you did. Yes, we, we had, uh, um, oh, I, I've got uh, a gold star and... Uh, you got a gold star? Yeah, one gold star, yeah. Wow. And uh, just for that, and, and I got some others that were, they weren't gold stars, they were just battle stars. And on your ribbons, why, when you see these, these officers or men, They've got all these little patches on their thing, their little bars, you know, all sorts of different uh, ones. And they would take those, and they, if you had a one for battle, it'd be a certain size, it'd be on there. So I had quite a number of those, yeah. I. Uh, Did you bring those with you? Uh, no, I left those at home. <laughs> I, tell you, I tell you what I've got at home, Doc. I don't know if you could do it. I'm real proud of it, and I don't know this day how I kept it. It's a a little smaller than the curtain. It's a, a silk scarf that we used. They gave it to the crewmen and the pilots. 
And in case you got shot down near an island, why it had all the currents and the islands, and it would show you how the currents would go. So if you're in your little May West, and you try to get a paddle, you try to not stay in that current, go someplace else, might not get captured. And I had that for, well, I got it in 42 and kept it all, and it's very good shape. I've got it in my living room. And my, my daughters, they had it framed here in Sterling just for Father's Day last year. And it's beautiful. It's all in silk. Maybe and we could come take a picture of it. You could. With this camera. You know, you, you, yeah. I'd be delighted. We'll see about I'm that. quite proud. I don't know today how I kept it so nice. You got your bad, your uh, medals too? Oh, a few of them. Yeah. I've lost some. I'm, I'm going to get <laughs> okay. some more. This is an emblem off of my... Uh, well, we'll... Here, hold that up. Yeah. Oh, th this is this is the squadron emblem that we wore on our jackets. Right, she'll zoom in on that. It's... it's Squadron VF-34, and what that is, that's a gun sight, and that's the islands of Japan. So we've got that, and that's what we wore in our jackets. This is one I didn't use, so I'm kind of proud of it. Yeah. I keep it in a little album. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I was in three squadrons, 34, 48, and 53. Even though 50, uh, 48 and 53, uh, they... Uh, were earlier than this one. This one I just got into later. And uh, 53 was the one in South America. And 48, and this one were in the Pacific. Okay. And everybody designed their own emblem and somebody printed it up. Okay. So you were single all the time you were in the service. Yeah. You and Helen got married. Yeah, I got married when we came we back. Got back. And then you raised your family. You got right. a pretty nice family, huh? So tell us a little bit about your family. You okay, got I, I have three daughters and a son. Right. This, the oldest one is Sue Lambert, which is a school teacher, eighth grade in Sterling High. She's been a teacher for 20 some years. Then my next one was Wayne the boy, John Wayne. He was quite a famous cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's his name. Does he appreciate you naming him like that? You know, he goes by the name of John now. Does he? Okay, John, yeah. okay. But in that's high good. school, he got tra oh, ridiculed over John Wayne, hi, big boy. <laughs> you know? And then we had Ann. She's a nurse. She's at our hospital here. Yeah, we know Annie. And uh, in her final stages of training, she will get her RN uh, December 15th or right in there. Okay. Then she might get employment. We don't know. And then the other one, uh, she was married, and then she divorced, and she married Doug Hale, who sells insurance. And uh, um, what's her name? Deborah, what? Debbie. Debbie. Okay. Debbie Hale. Okay. Yeah. And uh, well, so how many grandchildren you got? We have thirteen. Thirteen. Holy mackerel! And they're all we living. We won't get into that. But and they're all living. The no, youngest one is Sue's got the oldest and the youngest. Oh, really? I don't know how that happened, but that's what happened. <laughs> and. Uh, She's now, Sue's married to uh, Jerry Lambert. Jerry over here. He's a pharmacist yeah, at the hospital. Yeah, I know Jerry really yeah. well. Yeah, and uh, so uh, she's got the only two kids at home. Her, she had five, and the only two are two girls at home. One's a seventh grader, and one's a junior in high school. Uh -huh. She keeps telling me, Dad, I'm going to be the oldest person down there with kids graduating. I'll be in a wheelchair by the time Jesse gets out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. Yeah, and, that's great. Okay, so and you got God. a nice family. Yeah. And you're Our doing oldest. good. And you, when you came back, no, now you entered the, I remember you, but you were the uh, chief uh, driver's license uh, yeah. evaluator okay. and examiner yeah. Yeah. for years. Later, later first, well, first when I come back, I, Max Pollan, a local man who everyone been here a while would know him, he's dead now, he hired me to work at Stickney's. Right, okay, and, and you were at Stickney's. Yeah, I was okay. at Stickney's. And, um, I uh, used Man. to go out and eat hamburgers out on West Main. Roy Willard had a little place out there. And I liked it pretty good. And I said, oh, I'd like to do it. He said, you know, I'm looking for a partner. He said, why don't you come out? I was on vacation. Uh, and he, he said, why don't you come out a few nights and see if you'd like it or day, whatever. So I went out and God, I just loved that business. So I come back and I said, you know, I agreed on the price. And I told him, I'll buy it. So uh, Max Pollan come back, and which was very nice, said, John, we like you down here. He said, if that doesn't work out, your job's waiting for you. I thought that was real nice of him. Well, it worked out, and I had that 21 years. Right. And we, we called it, uh, first we started out, one called the Dairy Queen, and then we went 
and you had to pay them a franchise. And I thought, I can sell just as much stuff without having to pay them a franchise. <laughs> so I did and called it the Big B, B for Barton. Right. And that's how we got started. Right. And uh, I ate a lot of hamburgers. There. Yeah. And then after that, <laughs> I decided, well, we worked uh, quite a few hours a day, and that was when the oil boom was on. And we paid for the place in uh, seven years because we were open seven days a week. And I said, well, I'm not going to kill myself on this. And if somebody didn't show up, you had to take their shift. So we started closing on Mondays. And then later on, I said, Helen, there's got to be another life besides this. So I uh, uh, found out about this driver's license opening. Uh, remember Floyd Montgomery? Yeah, sure. He was the head one down there. He said, John, I'm going to retire. He said, we're going to have an opening. And uh, I didn't know what it involved, but I went up to Denver and took the test. And there were 500 people taking the test. Wow, is that right? Wanting to go anywhere, see? Yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> I thought, I told Helen, I said, well, 500, that kicks out. We'll have to keep this joint, see? And uh, I got a notice back that came up for a personal interview. I was number seven out of the 500. Wow. And I got interviewed, and so I got to start with the driver's license. I sold my drive in to a man called Harold Baker, who I knew. Yeah, sure. A and uh, he was in the Navy, by the way, too. And uh, then I worked for the driver's license 22 years, and I retired out of that. And now I'm just plain retired, just, just having more fun. The older you get, the more fun you have. <laughs> yeah. No. And you've been a big uh, automobile guy. I oh, mean, yes. I remember because I talked to you a long time ago about Model A's and stuff sure. like that. You, I remember one time you come out and got some Model A parts. You're going to work on your brakes or something. Yeah, I never got it done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I ended up with uh, none of them are as nice as that one you have. I, and that was my big. I should have just stuck to two or three. But every time I go to a sale, I'd say, "Hey, that's pretty cheap. I'll buy it." Yeah. So I bought those. I ended up with ten. Ten A's. Ten. Is that no, right? well, A's. some A very some Model T, some A's, a Henry J, a Nash, and I've got that twenty-five star, which is similar to yours. It's a two-door sedan, four-cylinder, made by uh, uh, Durant Motor Company, and uh, it uh, I got it from Jim Yap, a local man here. And he bought it and decided he'd never fix it. And I said, boy, if you'll sell it to me, I'll fix it. So we overhauled the motor, rebuilt it. Stan Heist, who was another friend of mine, painted it for me. He's long gone. He worked for Cochran's. Yeah. He was also a fireman, I believe. And uh, so, yeah, I taken a took my Model T on a tour to, to South Dakota. There were 250 Model Ts from all over the United States, and I was one of them. And I did not break down. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> okay. Um, that I brought a lot of pictures anyway, to we show help, you there. Anyway, we appreciate you coming yeah. by and talking to us, and, uh, okay. and uh, thanks a lot, John. Okay. All right, this is a picture on the Saratoga on the hangar deck, which was under the flight deck of the plane that was burnt. There were a number of them under there that we couldn't save and the fire was too intense. You can see how the aluminum bodies just melted. And it was a terrible fire back up above. And this shows there's a fire hose way up here and they're trying to put out the fire the best they can. Now here's another photo of some of the planes. This one didn't get burnt, but the fire is all off to the side of it. And uh, this Next picture is the same plane that you saw in the previous one, except there are some others up front uh, that have been hit pretty hard. The Japs dropped their bombs and suicide planes to the front of the plane, so that the, to the front of the carrier, so that we couldn't take off again. Now there's what they did. See, you can launch them on here. But what we did, we found out that after we got the fire under control and stuff we could take and back up, because it'd go 35 knots forward. We couldn't go quite that fast, but the planes, the wings would open up and they'd go the other direction. We'd take off and land. And this is a picture of one of the planes that shows how big it is. That's our complete squadron standing beside it. That is called a TBF torpedo plane. It was rather slow and it had uh, twin 50 caliber machine guns on it, big Pratt Whitney engine. And that's this, and uh, I'll get a couple more here. 
here's one that had a little bad luck it landed and uh, the uh, wing got tore off when it hit the the uh, side of the carrier now this is a shows some of the battles we were in um, the this is some of the big battles that give you the stars this represents airplanes that we that we uh, bombed on the ground or shot down this is this is uh, tankers or warships or anything and this is islands that we dropped bombs on you can see the little bombs down here at the bottom are called sitting ducks those were planes that were on the ground that we destroyed from the air and that's what that designates and this is a picture of some of the bombs that were being loaded for a strike I'll take and put this down here like the size bombs and all the guys have got little carts and, and they put them on the planes and uh, this is another group of my squadron that shows how large the plane is and that's just the fighter group there and I've got a little bitty arrow right here and that's me in those days and uh, is right there and this is a picture of the carrier from up above. We always call them, it looks at a distance like a postage stamp. It wasn't very big. The fire probably is highest, and, and a lot of that is smoke. And, and this is, is John Barton, yours truly, in my flight gear. That's what we wore. And, uh, uh, th this is, And, and this is a little front page of a newspaper that we had on board the ship called Plain Talk. And if you can see, it says USS Saratoga. And that's our plane again, see. And that was just a copy that I made. And we had this as a rooster. And in the, down below, our rooster was over our little cafeteria. And that uh, is at the bottom. They used, our ship couldn't be sank, so we used it for, um, testing off of uh, Etiwito, I believe was the island's name. And uh, then these are the, this as a pilot that could no longer fly in battles. So they made him a signalman and he would take these flags and he'd, he'd either put one wing down or get them level or so forth. That designates how you were coming in. And when he'd come in, why he'd flag it off and the plane is landing. Very close, you can see the tail hook is just ready to, ready to be there. And this is a, another photo of different ones. And the planes are all lined up, ready to take off. We, we started at the back, and they'd move them forward to take off. And when you land, why, they take all these and put them to the front. And uh, well, I guess that's about it. Okay, Th this is a, a uh, map, it's a silk map that the service put out to all pilots and crewmen. We carried that with us on all our missions. <clears throat> and uh, in case you got shot down, it's waterproof. You could take that out and kind of see where you wanted to be. Uh, there's Japan up here, coast of China. And these lines that you see are currents. And that's the way the water goes all the time. There's they're just, they're just thousands of them along here. So you could get an idea if you were shot down and, and did survive the crash, probably be in a little life uh, boat of some kind, rubber raft. Why then you could maybe direct yourself to friendly hands. And I got that in 1942 and I've had it all these years. This is 2000. And uh, my daughter saw it in the closet one day and said, Dad, can I have that for a while? And I said, yes. So she took it in and, and had uh, Mrs. Whipke make the frame for it and mount it for us. It's on the back side. There's another map similar to this one, but it's quite heavy to take down, so I don't do it. I just look at this one side. But uh, this has a little thing. It says East China Sea, and it was uh, given to me in 42, and I suppose it was made about maybe a little before that. But all, all pilots and crewmen carried those. And I don't know that there's any more in Sterling because 
I don't know, I'm a pack rat, I save everything. And so I saved that all these years. And I'm uh, quite proud of it. And it's, uh, any anyone that ever flies over the water, you don't dream there's that many currents in the water. Mm -hmm. And you being in a travel agent, I bet you don't tell your people, look at all the currents that are in those. <laughs> You want me to start talking? Yeah, why don't okay. you? Th this is an emblem that we had when we had sewed on our jackets. This is the, the uh, island of Japan in a gun sights, VF-34. And uh, this is uh, occupation that you were just over see Fujiyama right there and the, with the little boats down there. But I have a number of these, but I don't know what I did with all of them. And this is the Asiatic Pacific. And um, here is a dollar bill that um, we got on board ship. I got a lot of these, and it says Hawaii on one side and big ones on the back. And I've never used it. I just kept it as brand new. And this is the little thing we got when it got discharged. It's called a ruptured duck, a little pin that you put on your jacket. And along with this, is, it says you were in the reserve uh, during the war. And this is just a little bomb that, we showed we were in ordnance. Now this little pin here, it's from Purcell, Oklahoma. That's where we went for advanced gunnery school. And uh, these are the ribbons. There's three battle stars, and, and that's you can't see the name very good, but there it is, J. A. Barton. And uh, I'm going to get this all together.